Um, I'm now uh, have the opportunity to introduce uh, Tom Insel, a wonderful neuroscientist, co-founder and president of MindStrong Health. Um, he is a psychiatrist. Uh, he was the director of the National Institute of Mental Health from 2002 to 2015. He's in the National Academy of Medicine. He's really just an amazing, amazing colleague. Came here to Verily after leaving uh, service in the federal government. And how lucky we are to see his kind of connections and um, kind of the way that you think is so amazing. But I do want to take the liberty of saying something personal. Um, I met Tom actually a very long time ago, but in 2002, uh, when Tom was stepping in to be the director of the NIMH, I also was taking a big step. I was taking the step to be a chairman of psychiatry in another department uh, in the country. And what Tom didn't know was also at that time, I, my husband had what would be a fatal neurodegenerative disease. I had four children, and here I was one of very few women who were taking on leadership roles in academic medicine at that level. And he said to me at a meeting, he took my hand and he said, I will do anything I can to help you. And uh, it's pretty, I know, well done. <laughs> You, you didn't know, you didn't know, and you didn't know the impact of those words, but it just felt like I had someone somewhere who was going to help us build the work that needs to be built in academic medicine in the service of mental illness and understanding mental illness. So uh, Tom's one of my personal heroes, and he's going to talk with us today about digital phenotyping. Well, that's uh, very touching. I didn't, that's an argument for investing in social capital, isn't it? Uh, and uh, sometimes those are the most profitable investments of all. So, so good to hear about that, Laura. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I think this is really a great opportunity to bring groups of people who often don't get together, at least at this scale. And, and there's a very important conversation to have. Laura started that conversation with her opening remarks and a meet, I think, followed on to some extent to say that um, we're facing a really urgent crisis. It's a medical crisis, it's a social crisis, it's a, it's a moral crisis that has to do with the uh, morbidity and mortality of, of mental illness and now um, on top of that, this opiate epidemic, which many people have pointed out has now surpassed the AIDS epidemic in terms of its mortality rate. And I'd love to tell you that um, we have everything we, need, everything we need to do to, uh, is already in hand to be able to face this. But uh, in fact, we're, we're groping. And what we're trying to do is to bring the technologies from each of these spaces, from neuroscience, from genomics, from information science, together in some way to address this. And you've heard already some beautiful examples from Ed and from Amit about um, ways to, to take this overlap. And in the case of what Ed was saying with um, Channel Rhodopsin, bringing a great neuroscience together with great genomics, uh, Amit was talking about the importance of using neuroimaging clinically in some really novel and exciting ways. Uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the red circle there about the technology and information science and what that may be able to do and suggest to you two things that I think are sort of intriguing. One is that we need to f be looking more carefully and more innovatively at behavior as well as at the brain. And the second is that some of the tools that we might need, because in every one of those circles, it's tools that are going to drive the innovation and going to make the impact. But in this particular one, we may have some pretty, pretty good tools already available. In fact, um, perhaps the most powerful one is one that every, every one of us carries around in our pocket. This is a quick list of how I think about this technology a revolution of the last decade or last 12 years, in some ways 2007, 2008 were really the transformative years, but we're still learning the lessons and looking at how these will play out uh, in a whole range of different areas of medicine. I'm not gonna go through all of this and some of you can probably update it because uh, some of these figures are about a year old, but I wanna focus on the top line 
I'm going to talk, us, talk to you about smartphones and to point out what, what really all of you know, because this is a technology that you're carrying around in your pocket. Uh, but if you're my age, you begin to marvel at times that this really has the power, in fact, it surpasses the power of the Cray 2 supercomputer, which in the mid 1990s was really um, the gold standard for uh, both power and memory in terms of computing. Um, I should also point out not only the size of the Cray 2, which required its own cooling unit in its own room to be able to operate, uh, but the cost, which as you can see here, I think was around $23 million in 2010 dollars. So anytime somebody starts complaining about the cost of the new iPhone, um, you can have that as your reference point. You get quite a bit uh, quite a few bits for the buck uh, in what we're carrying around in our pockets. And it's not just that we have them, but these have taken the world by storm and they're transforming um, every part of the world at this point. Um, this is a continuing growing market. Three billion of these supercomputers now deployed. Most people think it will be up to six billion within the next two to three years. I have to confess, I didn't really appreciate um, the enormity of this until um, earlier this year, I was on safari in Tanzania, and uh, even Maasai warriors out in there, and this is a real thing, uh, are using these phones. I was intrigued by where they even come from. These people don't have access to clean water, they don't have stable electricity, and yet they all have these knockoff Samsung phones I actually tracked this down to the nearest town. There are no paved roads, but about 60 miles away on the track, there was, um, in fact, these two, t two kiosks in Karatu, Tanz Tanzania, uh, both which had Obama names on them, one for Michelle and one for Barack. This was the source of phones that are transforming Tanzania. Good thing to know because today it's China that's transforming all of Africa, not America. But in this respect, this is a technology uh, which we still have some imprint on and which is making its way through every part of the world. So the natural question is, with this urgent problem we have around morbidity and mortality for mental illness, which has not changed in 20 or 30 years, in fact, in some ways, the problem is getting worse, not getting better. Can we use this already ubiquitous technology that's already been adopted to do something about it? And I think one way to answer that question, to go back to Tom Khalil's points from early this morning, or to first sort of frame the question is, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Why have we been so unable to make a difference here? Why have we failed? What needs to be done? I've spent much of the last two years, after spending something like $20 billion at NIMH and not bending the curb there, trying to figure this out, and spending um, a lot of my time traveling, talking to people in the front lines, trying to get some sense of like, where did we go wrong? What have we not done better? At the same time, you know, I've been able to see where a lot of success has happened in cancer, heart disease, certainly for infectious diseases. So where have we missed out? And I've come up with sort of four, they're not perfect, but there are four suggestions for where we've missed the mark. Amit focused on one of them, imprecise diagnosis, the fact that these labels like depression don't really have a biological validity to them or a specificity. There's also the fact that unlike in other areas of medicine, most people with these disorders are in fact not in treatment. They're not in care for a whole range of reasons. Some of that has to do with access. Some of it has to do with the sort of stigma of having an illness that you don't want anybody to know about. And you, you actually think it would be worse to get the treatment than to, uh, to struggle with the illness. We have real problems with quality and quality control more than any other area of medicine. This is an area that just suffers from fragmentation, from lack of, of appropriate training, and from the fact that even though there's a workforce of some 400,000 people in the mental health workforce, there's only about 10% of those who have any medical training whatsoever. That's a problem for severe brain disorders. 
But I want to focus on the fourth problem, which actually Amit has introduced to you already, and that is that we don't measure. And as it's Peter Drucker said many years ago, we don't manage what we don't measure. This lack of measurement is really, I, I think, one of the most severe deficits in the field. I mean, mention this. I mean, what we actually do is pretty primitive. It is like one of the early airplanes. It's all subjective. How do you feel? Even though we're asking people who we know have a problem with subject, subjective experience, it's episodic when they show up. It's based in our brick and mortar clinics, which nobody wants to go to. And it's when we do use rating scales, they're scales that take time and aren't very effective. What do we want? Obviously, we need something objective, continuous, ecological, and if it's possible, something passive. And that brings me back to the phone, because the phone is the technology that's already out there. If I said to you, take out your phone, unlock it, and hand it to the person next to you, you'd say, excuse me? Because this is obviously, a, it's a window into your life. It's also a window into your brain. And the way to try to get into that window or to look through it is what we call digital phenotyping. It's this opportunity to collect all of this information that's coming into this supercomputer and use it to understand something about how you think, how you feel, how you behave, how your brain is functioning. What are those signals that matter? Well, there's several. Some are just the, the sensors that are on the phone. Activity, obviously, you can look at location and get some sense of where somebody's going and through GPS. You can look at just calls in versus calls out, texts in versus texts out as a measure of social behavior. It's primitive, but that metadata actually helps. Other people have focused in on speech and voice as a very powerful index into how somebody's functioning. We know that when people become depressed, their pronouns change. They go from saying you, the, and we to I, I, and I. That's been known for 30 years, but now through natural language processing, we have a way of doing that in real time and providing a very quick index of somebody's mood or of somebody's, the organization of somebody's thought. Or in the case of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, finding signals that begin to show the first signs of neurodegeneration in both the voice and in the speech, both how you talk and what you say. But what I wanna focus on is a third channel, which has gotten much less attention. It's what our company, MindStrong, has really developed, and it's called not brain-computer inter interface, but human-computer interaction. It's looking not at what you say or where you go, but it's using a content-free part of the phone that is how you type, not what you type, but how you type. It's the latency between, between hitting the space bar at a character. It's when you scroll, how you click. It's looking at this whole range of taps and scrolls and clicks on the phone, and from that, understanding something about how you're functioning. The idea, broadly, is to collect that information and through machine learning, map it onto the gold standard measures we have for cognition and mood and behavior, and then putting all of that together create this set of biomarkers that we call the digital phenotype. I should mention in passing, there's another channel that we don't use that could be used, which is to look at everything like your, your search history or your social media post. A lot of people find that really creepy, but there are also ways to access that information with agency. You can ask people using Google Takeout to actually, and if you haven't done this, it's fascinating, to review your own search history. It is like a window into the last year of your life. You'll find things in there. It's kind of like looking over an old photo album. You'll find things about yourself that you didn't remember from last summer or from last winter that are really fascinating. And, and Takeout allows you to grab all of that um, uh, really with the, the click of a button. So let's go back to this human-computer interaction, what we actually do, collect enormous amounts of data every time you touch the phone. That's a data point for us. And the concept we have here is to be able to pull all of that together. Uh, there's something like a thousand potential biomarkers in that because we look at this uh, in a time series. And then to try to validate that through clinical trials, uh, through 
this cognitive testing, as I mentioned, and even in a study done here at Stanford with Leanne Williams to use that to look at neural correlates with fMRI. I'm not gonna go through all of that for lack of time, but it's been a very interesting journey. I should mention, this was all actually, in our case, developed by our founder, Paul Dagum, who brought all of this not from medicine, but from cybersecurity. This was a tool that was first developed as a behavioral analytics tool to track hackers. And he called it digital fingerprinting. And now the question was, could we take this same tool and use it in medicine for digital phenotyping to understand much more about how somebody was, was functioning, really get a, a picture into their brain? So the first such study was to take a group of people where they had an extensive neurocognitive battery they had this app on their phone that was tracking every keystroke and then asking, could we understand, could we predict their neurocognitive scores on a whole range of tasks from cognitive control, verbal memory, uh, down this whole list of things that neuropsychologists use to understand cognition. Could we find the features on the phone from these digital biomarkers that would map onto this? And I think you can see here, the blue is their cognitive performance, across 27 people, there, and each of the dots is an individual's performance. The red is the features that were pulled off of their phone to predict that performance. It's not perfect, but it's about as good as the test-retest variation on those same cognitive tests. So it suggests that this could, in fact, be a pretty useful cognitive instrument. That was a picture of cognitive traits. The question I wanted to get at was whether we could look at mood states as well, because that's clinically what we are worried about so much, for instance, in the treatment of depression. We took a group of people receiving ketamine. These were people with treatment-resistant depression. They would respond to ketamine, a rapidly acting antidepressant, by um, showing uh, remission or recovery. But the problem with ketamine is it works very rapidly within a day, but most people relapse within a couple of weeks sometimes a week, sometimes four weeks. So we took a group of people and followed them for many months so across many, many different ketamine trials. And what you can see here, these are 10 different people. And again, the red indicates the digital uh, data that we had, the blue indicates their uh, Hamilton depression score. And what we were able to show is that in fact, you could use these signals from the phone to essentially predict with great precision how somebody's mood was doing. So this becomes now a way to collect data continually and passively without having to have people actually fill out the forms. So getting back to the challenge of measurement, what this suggests is that indeed we could do this using the technology that all of us have already. And then with good analytics and machine learning, find a way to get signals that would be objective, continuous, ecological, because this is in the real world, not in somebody's office, and entirely passive. The beauty also is that it's content-free, so it doesn't get into a lot of the issues of privacy that people worry about, that you're looking at where I go, it's, it's the surveillance, that you're listening in on what I say. We don't do any of that. It's simply looking at the taps and clicks without ever having to look at the content. There's the option, too, to be able to do what Amita talked about and to use this then to revise the way we do diagnostics. And this is uh, borrowing a figure from Leanne Williams' lab, which suggests the possibility of taking this kind of data, new kinds of cognitive and behavioral data, bringing it together with neuroimaging, bringing it together with clinical assessments that can be done to create a new, a new way of classifying mental illness. And of course, even more exciting for us is that you can not only build with this single technology that we have, the digital phenotyping to do better assessments, but that same platform can be used to deliver treatments, some of which are psychological. It can be used to do, improve our care management by integrating data across all of these different channels. And for the first time, it can create what we've always dreamt of here, which is a closed loop to be able to learn as you go and to constantly check each of your interventions to find out what their impact has been. That what that looks like in real life is something that we're building now, which has to do with providing the kinds of, di uh, of, of dashboards and the kinds of continual monitoring and feedback that you can give to patients through the MindStrong Care app. Others have done this, like at uh, 
um, in, the, in this case to look at uh, crisis text line where they're looking for people who are in a crisis and can text out in real time and get a response back within 90 seconds. This has gotten tremendous uh, uptake from the field. Uh, also has become a fantastic source of, of really now national data for how uh, individual, individuals as well as communities are doing 24-7. Um, uh, there are also opportunities like a company uh, called Seven Cups that is, has sort of married um, Alcoholics Anonymous and Facebook together to say, let's create a global peer support platform that uses, again, the same technology that brings people together, not in the sense that Facebook has just for social contact, but in this case, for supportive contact. You have a problem, you get online, and soon you're getting help from somebody else. But even more importantly, what, what Seven Cups has discovered is the most powerful therapeutic intervention of all, which is that suddenly you have an opportunity to help somebody else. You're empowered to be useful. And what they've been able to do is, uh, and now growing at some extraordinary rate, I think it's growing about 19% uh, month on month, is to create this network of communities of people with um, personal issues that are looking for help from each other. Now, all of this is, I think, going to give us a different kind of mental health care system. Because on each of those issues that I talked about as being the impediments to bending the curve, I think we can now begin to see their solutions for diagnostics, for engagement, for the problems we have with quality, and most of all, being able to measure in a way that we haven't before. I want to end by saying that as exciting as this is, we still have, I think, two major challenges in front of us to make this real. One of them is to show the value of what we've got, not in an academic sense or an economic sense, but in the sense of the real world of clinical care, is this actually saving lives? Is it reducing morbidity and mortality? And that's still very much a work in progress. A bigger issue in some ways right now is the public trust challenge. Can we get people to realize that this actually is going to be helpful? And can we get um, companies to make sure they do this in a way that's responsible and transparent? Our goal in all of this is to be able to empower patients and families, and I think if we use that as our, as our North Star, we'll come out on the right side and, and really make a big difference <clears throat> for lots of people who need it. Thank you very much.